This meeting is being recorded. Hello everyone, how are you? Happy Friday, I guess that's the end of the week. So it's nice to be able to see everyone for Putnam again. Just to double check, is my audio working right now? Yes, okay, then we're good to go. Right, we're almost all the way, well, I say we're almost all the way through the semester because Thanksgiving is this moment when a lot of people are going home. So in some sense, in, in our mind, it's like it's getting close to that and then I guess we'll have a few more weeks afterwards. But we're still going to do some math problems, and so today we're going to work on combinatorics. Uh, let me switch what I'm sharing right here to the, the problems that we're going to talk about today. So combinatorics is a really interesting field. Uh, the problems in combinatorics are the ones which sometimes you look at and you say, I wonder what I'm supposed to use to solve this. And really what you're supposed to use is creativity, and that's what makes the subject quite interesting. In fact, a lot of the questions are understandable to a lot of people, but to actually solve it is not that simple. Well, let's see. So I want to start with some of these to, I guess, to warm up. Let's start with playing with the first question. Suppose that what I have is I have a subset of 1, 2, 3 up to 2n. And suppose I have n plus 1 elements. Show that we can find two numbers so that one of them divides the other one. Hmm. Any ideas? As usual, what we'll do is, uh, if you have an idea, please uh, type into the chat, raise hand, and then I'll on you and then we can kind of crowdsource these ideas together and maybe what I'll do is while we're waiting for the first idea I don't expect you to solve the problem right away I just want any little idea that's fun but I'm just going to write the problem again on the other screen which is to say that I have you know numbers 1 2 up to 2n and I'm picking n plus 1 of them find a pair that divides each other so let's do this we're given n plus 1 numbers from the set 1, 2, up to 2n. Show that there's always one that divides the other. Any little ideas are, are very, very welcome. Ah, so let's try Rajiv. So this is a very small idea, but if one is in the set, then it's guaranteed that one will divide another because one divides every natural number. Cool. OK, so the way I often write down what we're thinking is like, look, if one is in the set, then you're done because you're supposed to prove that there's some number that divides the other. You're done because one divides all the rest, right? One divides all of the rest. Cool. OK, I saw there was another idea, Jack. I, I had actually a similar thing, uh, except using two. And oh. saying if two is in the set, and we had another even integer, what, or that the only way there couldn't be an even integer is if you had only odd integers in the set. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I think you're trying to do... You're, 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 this, we're learning a lot about the problem as we go. I like this. And any other even integer, then you're also done since two divides other even. And where you're going with this is like, hang on a second, then, you know, then everything else is odd, right? So kind of like you're doing this case. It's almost like a case. If 2 is in, then your only possibility is to avoid. So, so, so you're sort of doing proof by contradiction. So then the, so then the only way to avoid having one number, I see more ideas, I'll call in a second, one number dividing another is for uh, all the others to be odd. That's cool. And you could use this to go and try to find some contradiction or some size. Erica has an idea. So I realize like any number less than or like n or lower 
then it's like 2n is in the set and so for any of those numbers you like can't choose the other one and so you have like a pairing um and so once you have that i think you could just show that there's no way to choose n plus one elements such that like at least one of them is not like divisible by the other and i think like all of them you could prove that at least one is like two times the other Okay, so there's a lot of very good ideas here that I want to unpack. The first thing is you, you said, like, look, take look at the numbers 1 up to n. If I look at double of them, then I have 2 up to 2n. Okay, that's cool. And the reason this is cool is it's somehow, I'm writing down all your ideas, right? Somehow, then you get, like, a pairing. And if you, if you have a pairing, it's like there are n pairs. There are n pairs. And you wanted to show, you were, I guess, using the pigeonhole principle, saying, like, I have n plus 1 numbers. I think that's what you were getting at, right? There was some idea here of somehow pigeonhole principle. And somehow that would mean that there's, like, n plus 1 things implies maybe that uh, some pair has both. Okay, so th th there's these ideas, and somehow, like, the thing and double the thing, then, well, it definitely has the thing divides double the thing. This is not, like, a whole proof yet. These are all very useful ideas. Can we kind of put them together? We could actually try to finish one way, finish another way, lots of different ideas out of it. Oh, sorry, I actually have a third way. Mm. Could you do it by induction, by any chance? Okay, new way. I'm going to go to a new screen. You want to have, a, you see a, a problem with n's in it, so try to do it by induction. Induction. Yeah, so, like, if you know it holds for smaller sets, then you have two cases. Either, like, your n plus 1 elements are a subset of, of like, a previous case, mm -hmm. in which case you're done by the induction hypothesis. And otherwise, it includes, like, one of the new two numbers that you added, and I don't know if that makes a okay. difference. Okay, so th let's write that down, right? Because if you're trying to do an induction, it's like, okay, I assume it holds for all smaller values of n. Now I have n, okay? So now I have this thing. So now I have this particular value of n, and I have n plus 1 things from 1, 2, up to 2n. Now your idea was like, look... Let's look at how much I have up to 2n minus 2. Because yeah. that's like the smaller bit, right? So this big set here is it's 1, 2, up to 2 times parentheses n minus 1 is what I'll call it. Uh, union, well, it's got the next thing. It's 2n minus 1 and then 2n. And what you're saying is like, look, if I have at least n things from my n plus 1 here, mm -hmm. I'm done because I can use induction on that. Yeah. And what about the other case? Let's try to figure it out. This is a good like starting point for an idea, okay? So you've got like a case one, which is that you already have at least n from here. Okay, that's that case. And, and uh, that case is like done by induction. IND is going to stand for induction. And then my handwriting might be hard to read. It looks like a parenthesis. So I'll write in done by induction. And there's the other case, case 2. Now case 2 is like less than n from there. Whoa, does that mean you have to take both of these? You do. Ooh, okay. So it's like less than n from the first 1, 2, up to twice n minus 1. And that implies that you have both of the 2n minus 1 and 2n. OK, these are all ideas. We're brainstorming. The way you solve any problem is you just kind of start all of these different pathways and see what works. Anyone want to take another step on one of these pathways or start another pathway? Jack Liu. So, so back to the idea about the pigeonhole principle. I'm, I'm, I'm not too familiar with this because we're only going to start talking about this in concepts now. But you have to, I think you have to like, 
to find some partition of the set, right? Your pigeonholes, right? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. So first we have to say, what is the pigeonhole principle? So let's just quickly go over this. The pigeonhole principle says that if you have n pigeons and n plus one holes, then there's always a pigeon with more than one hole in it. <laughs> oh, that's not the one you're thinking about? Yeah, so I guess that, that those pairings are, are the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, was being, I was being silly. Yeah, okay, right. But <laughs> ultimately, you guys are used to thinking of it like, what, n plus one pigeons and n holes, right? And then somehow there's a hole with at least two pigeons in it. So, so yeah, what's, what's the, you, you don't quite like the pairings. There's something a little bit off on the pairings. Is that right? Oh, I'm not sure. I think I was going to go along with that. I was thinking maybe you could, like, the set is one to two n, so you could partition it into n things where for all things between one and n, just pair it with the thing that's twice it. Okay. That's getting ahead of myself, but. So let, let me put down what, what we're saying here, right? There was a keyword called partition. And so I guess this is idea seven already. And, and so what we have here is that um, pigeonhole principle, uh, again, you don't need, it's not like rocket science. It really is just if I have too many things for my holes, then a hole has at least two things in it. This is very obvious, obvious statement. But you need to partition. Oh, need to partition is if you wanted to use the pigeonhole principle. Then you need to partition the set 1, 2, up to 2n into n holes. Those are the holes, right? And somehow the n plus 1 pigeons are what you're putting in the holes. But the thing about the pairing, I'm just going to put a slight warning, is that they're not, oh, I'm looking at this. Er Erica, do you want to just say what you said? Because I can't read your writing very well. Oh, I was going to say, like, for instance, four. It's like two times four, but then also four times two. So, like, the numbers get repeated. So yeah, you can't it, actually. It's still a very good idea, which is why I wrote it there. But the problem is it's not quite a partition yet. A partition would mean that you would say, the number four, it's in that hole. Or more importantly, actually, the four is not the problem. You see, the pigeonhole principle, if you allowed your holes to be even bigger, if you allowed your holes to overlap, I'm not sure how you'd make holes that overlap, but I, I'm just trying to imagine, like, in the pigeonhole principle, we've got, like, all of these holes, and we're just putting some pigeons in. And if you're putting in more pigeons than there are holes, even if holes, like, overlap with each other, it just makes it easier for a hole to have more than one pigeon. The overlapping holes is not the problem. The problem is that there are some places that aren't covered. Like if I look at this, there is a number that's missing. It's 2n minus 1. That's an odd number. And so I, in, order to, in order to do a partition, I actually need to find some way to include that number too. OK, so some more thoughts. Uh, uh, Raid? Um, I, was, I was wondering why we have to partition it into n holes. Why oh. can't we just partition it into two? So like odds and evens, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, you don't. You don't. Uh, actually, I should be very careful of this. Let's just not say you need to. It's like somebody wanted to. Want and need are different things. <laughs> and uh, maybe you can do it with another way as well. So you're like, you want to partition into odds and evens. 2n is an even number, so there are odds and evens. Let's see what happens. What you want to do is you want to say, look, I have 1, 2, up until 2n is equal to the odds. Oh no, I was going to write the union symbol and I was like, that just looks like a capital U. But I guess I can use different color, evens. That's also possible. I, I could do that. Did you want to do something with this particular partition? Or not yet? Um, yeah, so like, like the size of the, like the odds and evens are uh, pairwise disjoint. So like the size of odds, unions, evens is equal to 2n. But then the size of the odds is n. So like, I don't know. I, I want to say like the worst you can do in terms of pairing, like in terms of selecting a subset is uh, choosing a subset that is that has elements that are not linked to themselves, right? So like the worst you can do is n. If you choose an element more than that in that set, then, you know, things go wrong. OK, I'm going to write down that idea, right? You have some idea of like analyzing the worst case, right? And your idea of analyzing the worst case, and there's also this notion of like linked. Do you mean by linked like something dividing something else? Uh, yeah, like the pairings we ah, the pairing, showed the pairing. before. Yeah. Uh -huh. Linked. Linked here is like k together with 2k. 
that's like some kind of linking, okay? Putting all of these things in. And there's an idea of worst case. So if we, could, if we can prove that that really is the worst case, then we're good. But the hard part of this is like, how do you prove that? We're still working on that. But I'm putting the idea anyway. Uh, Jack, you had a hand too. Yeah, uh, I was actually going to go back to the induction. Induction, I, here we are. So the thing that I was thinking is since we know in the second case, we know that we have to have both of them. But we also know that there has to be n minus one uh, from the other from the other section, and so I was thinking we could do the same thing we did again, except go to one two and then two times n minus two and the set n sorry two n minus one minus one two n minus one. Let's try it. Just a second. So we're doing six case two. Okay, that's what we're doing. And what you're saying is that you have the numbers 2n minus 1, the number 2n, and you have exactly n minus 1 from, actually I'm going to use the word many, n minus 1 many, from the first batch, 1, 2, up to 2 parentheses n minus 1. And now you wanted to break that apart too. You wanted to say, well, the first batch is equal to 1, 2, up until 2 times n minus 2 parentheses. And then we'll also take 2n minus, oh, this is hard. Is it 2n minus 3 and 2n minus 2? I think so. All right, so we're supposed to take n minus 1 from there. Hmm. Well, Oh, so you're saying like if you took all n minus 1 from the first chunk, you can use induction because yeah. this is a, yeah? Okay, yeah. So, so let's make this. So then you have case 2a. Case 2a is n minus 2 from here, okay? No, 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 n minus 1 from there, n minus 1 from there. n minus 1 from there, and you're done by induction. Okay, because that's like more than, this was double of the smaller number, double of n minus 2. So n minus 1 would be done by induction. But we have to then say, what's the other case? Case 2b. Case 2b is you take either one or both of these two things. Yes. Okay, so then we have like more stuff. It's really like case, we have basically case 2b, 2c, and 2d is what I want to say. It's like you either take only 2n minus 3, or you take only 2n minus 2, or you take both. Right? Well, I, uh -huh. Would you have to take both? Oh, would you have to take oh, both? Never mind, never mind. You could. All I know is that you could, right? Because the only thing is I'm saying, suppose that you don't take n minus 1 from here, then that means you must take at least one of these two at the end. But I don't know whether I took one or I took both. So I want to say, you actually have three cases. Uh, of which subset, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be specific, which non-empty subset, which non-empty subset of this you take. Okay, that's a, we, we could continue on this direction too. Uh, there was also another idea, I just want to quickly rename carefully. Uh, Frida Yash? Uh, yeah, I had an idea, but I don't think it will flush out the way I thought it would. So it's uh, uh, back to the idea where we tried partitioning, or we uh, tried to partition the set into odds and evens. Mm. So in the case that, okay, in the worst case where you have, um, like suppose you do use up all of your odds, like then like you do have like one in the set, so it checks out. And so even if you have like one even, and even if you have one even number that doesn't divide any of the rest, you have that one. But it, and then um, so I thought, okay, if you like have less than n odds, then you can't, then you don't necessarily have one. So then you're going to have um, more than two even numbers. I and see, so, I see. And you were like, I is, uh -huh, yeah. Um, so but I guess like the problem is is that you can't um, like you're not necessarily if you do have two even numbers, you can't. They might share like the co a common divisor too, but like I, you can't say for sure that they're going to divide, and that's where I was kind of stuck. Yep. But 
Yeah. So I see what you're doing. What you were doing was like, all right, let's analyze this worst case really carefully. Look, I can't take the one. One is off limits. So if I look at the odds, you were saying like, at most you can take n minus one from there because one's not allowed. Now you're supposed to take n plus one. So that means you better take at least two from the evens. That's a legitimate thought. But if I take at least, at least two from the evens, you were like, ah, too bad the question wasn't about GCDs. <laughs> because unfortunately, I can pick like 10 and 12, and they don't divide each other. But that's, that's the idea. It's an interesting idea. Uh, thank you. Uh, let's see, what else do we have here? Wow, we have lots of people. Uh, Nancy, is that, did I read that right? Nancy, Nancy. Yeah, um, so you have n odds, and every number from 1 to, n, one to 2 n can be written as an odd times a power. Two. Whoa, 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 this is now different. Okay, okay, so let me let me write this idea somewhere else. So this is like, you said there are n odd numbers, okay? So there are n odd numbers. We know that, we were just thinking about that. But you said there's something else which you want to use, which is that any positive integer can be written as, say it again? Um, a power of two times an odd number. As a power of 2, 2 to some integer times an odd number. First of all, before you continue, does everyone agree with this statement? This is called factorize. Take away the 2, take away the 2, take away the 2. Finally, you got all these 2s. All the 2s are gone. What's left? Odd number. That's true. And what do you want to do with this? Um, you can create the partitions based on the, um, the odd number. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> so you're not making a pair. This is actually quite interesting. So what you're saying is you have a different partition. You want to partition the numbers from 1, 2, up to 2n, not by pairing. In fact, you're going to make different size holes. We do it like this. You're going to go, here's one of them, 1, 2, 4, 8, and so on, until like whatever is the biggest power of 2 that you can find that's less than or equal to 2n. I'm just going to write here like less than or equal to 2n. I hope that my notation makes sense. This is not how you'd ever write something in like a math book, but I mean like all the powers of 2 as long as you're less than or equal to 2n. Okay, that's one of them. Another one of them is the next odd number, 3, 6, 12, 24, as long as they're at most 2n. 5, 10, 20, 40, as long as they're at most 2n. Keep going until the last one. The last one is 2n minus 1. But I can't multiply it by 2 or else I'll blow beyond 2n. So here's a totally different idea. These aren't pairs. In fact, they all have different sizes. The last few of them have only one. It's like a very small hole, so to speak. But if I have this pigeonhole principle that I'm doing now, can anyone connect the dots on this? Like, this is actually a really good idea. Uh, this, is a, this is a counterintuitive problem because this is how you, this is actually, we're, we're about to crack it. Uh, I'm not sure who is suddenly raising hands, so I'm just going to say like, hey, if you have a hand to raise now, just oh. like raise it again, and then I'll know that you have something you want to say. Rajiv, did you just raise your hand? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, now again, you have um, essentially n holes, and you have n plus one, uh, if you have n plus one things, and then you can put you know, if you're sorting them into the holes, then you know that at least two are going to be in one hole. And now all that's left to prove is that any two elements in one of the partitions, the, that one must divide the other. Yes. Okay. So this pigeonhole principle, it was like, all right, we have these, the pigeons are the n plus one things that we picked. That's how I'm thinking of it. Okay. So I have these n holes. These n holes are just like, when I pick something, like suppose I picked the number eight, and suppose I pick the number 6, and I suppose I pick the number 10, and the number 40, and so on, right? Like, I'm just saying, which ones did you pick, right? So somehow the pigeons... Oh, pigeonhole principle has no D, by the way. If you ever want to write down pigeonhole principle, there's no D in pigeonhole. Uh, pigeon has... Yeah, if you write P-I-D, I think that's like pigeon English. It's a different word. But anyway, so this is pigeonholes. Pigeons are the, uh, the N plus 1 numbers that you picked, numbers in the set. Actually, I don't even know what it was called, like picked or set, but let's just say in the set, okay? And then now, if I look at this, then there has to be some hole with at least two pigeons. Pigeonhole principle tells you there's something like this. Uh, 
implies that there is a purple row with at least two of the n plus one numbers. Okay, and then we just need to show we just need to know that one of them divides the other. And why is that? It's great. Why it's, it's true? Why why is it true that one of them divides the other? Sana. Um, is it because like the way you've constructed the set, um, such that like you can always express each, um subsequent number as like the multiple of it because you expressed it as like the way you've written it is like two to the power into an odd integer so it'll always have that common factor yeah so it'll always have the common factor of the odd integer and also like the smaller power of two the easier way i would explain it nothing's wrong with what you said the easier way i would explain it is that if i want to go from one to the other it's always times two times two like as I step forward, right? Always times two. So then, of course, if I grab any two things, I just times two times two times two a bunch of times and I get to the other one. Is that okay? Like, again, what you said is totally legitimate. I just, this is the way I think of it. And somehow you will get divisibility and the ratio will be the power of two, which is how many steps between them. But whichever way you look at this, that finishes the problem. In any single purple row, the numbers keep times two to get the next. So the earlier one divides the later one. And it's actually by a power of two. Okay. So that's this question. Uh, and this question is somehow, it's a, it's a classic slight twist on the standard pigeonhole principle, only because you have to make all these different size holes. I think I should also add this pigeonhole principle. In fact, the word pigeonhole principle is not even referring to pigeons and holes. Uh, just a fun mathematical history. The reason why it's called the pigeonhole principle is because there was a mathematician named Dirichlet who was doing something about fractions and write, writing. He was, he was actually interested in trying to approximate numbers like root 2 and pi by fractions. Actually, I'll talk about this uh, if you take my class next semester on this uh, discrete math. I think I'm teaching discrete math next semester. I usually teach it every other year. And we always talk about that somewhere in that class. And this was Dirichlet's box principle, uh, something related to continued fractions indeed. But uh, pigeonhole principle was a translation over from German. And what it was called in German was he was trying to refer to like mailboxes in a wall. I'm not sure if you've ever seen a picture of this or seen this. Actually, CMU has this in the math department, I think. It's like when you go into a big office, uh, all of the different professors have like a little box or your school or high school mailboxes. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about. A wall full of mailboxes. Has anyone seen something like this before? So that's what he called it. He was calling it that principle because it's like you've got all these boxes for mail and you have some letters going in. And if there's like more letters than there is mailboxes, then you'll have a mailbox with more than one letter. So then does anyone know why it's called the pigeonhole principle? It's an English thing. Would the pigeons carry the messages? Ah, well, you're yeah. too, too advanced. I think I, my brain was not that big. But somehow it's like, uh, yes, no, this is not about carrier pigeons. It's just like, it's, it's an English word for like pigeonhole. A pigeonhole is, I mean, the English word for that mailbox is actually a pigeonhole. I'm not sure if anyone knows this, but anyway, like those are, those are sometimes called like on the wall. Those are like your pigeonholes. Those are actually called pigeonholes that you put mail into. Okay, great. Anyway, that's enough uh, random history for now. Let's do more questions. Oh, somebody said a fun comment. What is this? Oh, no. <laughs> okay. Somebody is talking about other interesting translations that can happen, uh, things that are lost in translation. Okay. Oh, somebody sent me something else. Oh, wow. And meanwhile, somebody told me that the archaic spelling of pigeon actually has a D in it. So now I've learned more stuff today, which is very interesting. Wow. I guess that makes sense. It's the pigeon. Actually, no, that doesn't make any sense at all. I was going to be like, it makes sense. You should spell it with a D, except that that D is like a silent D. 
Anyway, okay, let's do some more problems. Uh, I will go into something that's actually in my field instead of trying to do history or, or English. Let's 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 do number number three. All right. So let's suppose that we have some finite set, uh, and now this is a, a this is a question where you have different uh, ways of writing down sets or collections of sets. So I'm using like a curly f. Uh, there's this collection of subsets. And it has the property that somehow, if you take any two things in that collection, they intersect, they overlap. And also suppose that we've done this in a way that you can't add any more, you can't take any more subsets to add to your collection. And you're supposed to prove that you have exactly half of all of the possible subsets that you could have. Questions like this usually take a while to parse uh, because it's like collections of subsets. So there's a set S that you're playing with, and you're grabbing different subsets of it, but you want to do it in a way where they always have some overlap. And do want, you want to get as many as you can, but somehow you need to show that you, no matter what you've built, if you've built something that you can't add on to, well then, you have exactly half. How might we think about this? Raise hat. So, uh, Arya? Uh, yeah, so the um, number of subsets of S will be 2 to the n, where n is the number of elements. So okay. then half that will be 2 to the n minus 1. Cool. Let's start with that. And let me also then write down some of the question here so that we can all stare at it together. Right? You already said, like, let's suppose n is, uh, just for sake of argument, let n represent the number of things in S. Okay, and what we were supposed to show, uh, we were supposed to show, trying to show, I'm just writing this down here so that we can all stare at it, trying to show if F is collection of subsets of S where every pair intersects And you can't add any more sets to F without losing the pairwise intersection property. What are we trying to, to show? We're trying to show that this, if all of this, then the number of sets collected into f is, you said, 2 to the power n minus 1. And what you said is because like the total number of subsets of s anyway would have been 2 to the power n, and half of them is 2 to the power n minus 1. Here I'm trying to be careful even with the way I'm writing the English. I'm writing like number of sets collected into F. I didn't want to write number of subsets in F because then you might be like, well, it's just like how many subsets are there in F? It's, English is too hard. But I just mean like how much, how much could you have collected? You want a big collection of pairwise intersecting stuff. More ideas. I see Matthew Garcia. Uh, what, do you have an idea you wanted to add here? Um, yeah, I was just thinking it might be helpful to look at the power set of this just to see the different subsets. Okay, power set of S is the collection of all subsets of S, 2 to the n of them. Actually, I think that's why it's called the power set, because it's like 2 to the power, how big is S? Okay, more ideas. I saw there were some more ideas. Jack, did you have something you wanted to say too? I just, I was going through and trying to figure out an example. Hmm. Example of how this could work, uh, or at least I think, is if every single set in F had the same element, or had if there's like one element x in uh, whatever the whole thing, and it's in every single one of the subsets that you have. Okay, all subsets of S containing a fixed element, containing a certain fixed element. So, you know, actually that's true. If I want them all to intersect, there's an easy way. Just go and stick one element and say, I'm going to take every set that contains you. 
Well, of, uh, of course, then every set is going to intersect because they all contain this one point. And the number of ways that I can find a subset where they all contain this one point, that's 2 to the power n minus 1. Is that clear to people? Because like there's n minus 1 other stuff, so n minus 1 other stuff, they all can, you know, do whatever they want. And so let me write that down. And so this thing gives you 2 to the power n minus 1 of them. Since you do anything outside, oops, ran out of space, outside that element. Okay. I'll stand here. Yeah, that's true. Cool. This is one example of like a way to do this. I see also Adivate had, had raised his hand. Um, no, never mind. Never nope, mind. okay, that's fine. I'll, go, I'll continue on down. Uh, Raid, did you have something you wanted to add? Um, I think I can also, also show that this is the only way we can have, um, so like every set in F contains a fixed element is the only way we can like make this possible by transitivity, right? Ah, so this is interesting. So there's a claim which is somehow by transitivity, all, all subsets, or all, all sets in the collection, F must intersect, implies must be 3. So I'm writing this down because this is actually one delicate piece of the problem. It would be great if we could prove this. But the problem is it's not quite true. You see, the notion of intersection is not exactly transitive. It's possible for, like, if you think about lines in, in you can, oh wait, that's a terrible example. Every pair of lines intersects. Well, except for parallel lines. Okay, that's, that's the way I can say. So like, an example of non-transitivity is like, there's a, there's, a, there's a problem a little bit with this claim, which is that, you know, like, I'll draw some lines. These are not, actually, these are sets. A line is a subset of the plane. And if I draw this picture, the first two lines intersect, the second two lines intersect, but the first and the third don't. Do you know what I mean? Intersection is actually not transitive. Although, wait, that's a bad example too. The reason that's a bad example is because we were supposed to have a situation where all of the pairs intersect. But I can give another example where I just draw this. Now if I draw this, I have that, if I take these three lines, every pair of the lines intersects, but it's not true that there's one common point for all of them. Oh, consider the Olympic rings for a Venn diagram. That would be maybe another way to go with this, right? So it, it does turn out that it, this is unfortunately not quite true. And in fact, I'm even going to say, it turns out there's another way to do it. Three is not the only one, and it's worthwhile to mention it. Does anyone know an example, or can you help me make an example? There's a way to do this for n equals 3. n equals 3 could have f equals something, and there's a way to make how many? I need four sets. I need to make four sets. Oh, somebody already typed it in. Uh, what's this? Nicholas. 1, 2, 2, 3, 1, 3. Well, okay, I want four sets. Can you turn? Ah, yeah, yeah, and 1, 2, 3. So one way I could do this, I'm going to draw it like this. 1, 2, 3, and I'm going to draw a picture where I say, here's a set. Here's a set, here's a set, and here's a set. Does my picture make sense what I just did here? I'm like, the sets are like what I circled, right? And if I take any two of these sets, they actually overlap. If I take this guy and this guy, they overlap on this thing. And if I take like the giant one, of course it overlaps with everything else. So I can actually make a system where there are four sets. F equals this, equals this thing. Uh, and so this actually gets 2 to the power, gets half. Half of 2 cubed, many. But there is no common element. So this question is kind of weird. It's, it's actually like, we want to show that the most you can get is half, and there's two very different ways to get half. One way is to go and say, stick an element, and then grab everything that contains it. And then you can also do this sometimes. 
Okay, more ideas. Okay, Ra is that Rajiv? Yeah, so one observation, I think, is just that the empty set can never be in the set, and mm. that the like S itself must always be in the set, um, because like the empty set can't be because any intersection is also empty. And um, what that means is that all the sets are inhabited. So then um, if, you know, S itself weren't in there, you could add S oh. and then S would have a common element with, with all the subsets. Which are That's cool. Now I understand why you said the empty first. So seven implies every set in my collection has something. That's important enough to tell you that, okay, suppose your collection didn't have the everything, then you better put it in. So if the whole thing, S, whole thing, wasn't in F, you can add it. And it will intersect individually with everything else, all others. Is this okay? Like that's actually how we should be thinking about this. We should be thinking like being a maximal collection, that's actually what this is called, uh, maximal collection F means that, okay, if that's not in it, why not? Let's try adding it. Oh, once I added it, I must, did I break anything? And the notion of did I break anything is, does it fail to be intersecting anything? But in this case, because you first did seven, you now know that if I throw it in, yeah, it's still going to intersect. Okay, more ideas, more ideas. I've been slow in answering all of these ideas. Uh, Nancy. I think you can show that um, it can't be more than two to the n minus one oh. using complements. Okay, so what you said is use complements. That's a very powerful idea. Use complements to show that the number in f is at most this 2 to the n minus 1, which is half of them. And why is that? How do you mean using complements? Because if you have a set a in your um, collection, then a complements intersect a is going to be that empty set, so it can't be in your collection. OK. Is it OK if I write a with a c there? Is that how you guys usually mm -hmm. write a complement? I know sometimes we do a with a bar. Uh, both are fine. <laughs> but I'm just going to write a c. a c, which is the complement, can't be in F. And that's because A and A complement don't intersect. You, you need to have that everything in F, all the pairs, all the pairs have to intersect. Therefore, you've got two completely disjoint sets, A and A complement. You have one or the other or neither. Okay, that's a very important statement. Then A complement can't be in F implies, like after you pair, well, I mean, the whole point here is now, now you pair. Now this pairing does work in the sense that this pairing A and A complement, you never have to worry about like two guys complementing, two sets complementing to become the same set, right? The complement is a bijection, that's the idea. And so if you pair up like this, uh, you have two to the power n minus one pairs, and at most one in F from each. Okay. That's nice. So now we have proven that no matter what, f cannot have 2 to the power n minus 1. Now how do we show that if f is just being as good as we can, you will get exactly 2 to the n minus 1 uh, out of it? So you already know that your set, your, the, the subsets have been partitioned into these pairs, right? Mm -hmm. You can only take one thing from each pair. So at maximum, well, you can have one thing from each pair. So that's two to the n minus one things because you pretty much took half of them. So almost, well, what that is, is that's still an upper bound. You haven't proven that uh, no matter what, you can always like extend. You see, what I mean is like, the problem is saying, well, I mean, show... If, if you take two to the n minus one of them, your next one has to be another thing from one of those complement pairs, which will then break it. That's right. But that one proves what we've written here. That proves that if you have a collection which has more than this, then you have a problem. 
But yeah, what we and need then you have the construction from before, which has two to the n minus one. Mm. So Maybe I need to be clear about what it said. It didn't say what's the one that has the most. What it said is, suppose that you're staring at a collection F and some lazy person made it for you. You don't get to control it. A lazy person just showed up and said, hey, this is the most I can get. Now, you're not allowed to go and say, hey, I don't like your sets. I have better sets for you. All you can say is, I'm going to go and find some more sets to give you. You were too lazy. You didn't check these ones. Do you see the nuance here? This is actually one slight, one very important difference. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and don't worry. It's just like the, the, the way it was written probably makes it hard to see that through. This is the difference, by the way, between the notion of what's called maximal and what's called maximum. This thing we're saying is maximal. Maximal just means that some lazy person showed up and said, I'm done. And your job as the grader is to say, no, 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 I can improve your solution. It's like if you're trying to write code and someone else wrote really lousy code and you're trying to do something better, you're often like, can I just write this from scratch? But they're like, no, you have to use every line that I wrote. Uh, that's, the best, that's the best example. <laughs> something like this, okay? So now that's the, that's the nuance. So how do we deal with that? Uh, Jack? So, so what I was thinking is, We've already gone over the examples of if you have one common element and if you have three com common elements. So I was thinking if, I don't know if we have to use induction, but if we keep doing more and more common elements, seeing if there's like a pattern as to, as to how you could form it around those, form your uh, set around those common elements. Cool. Okay. So there's this notion of common elements that you're talking about. Okay. I'm just going to write that thing down. There's some notion of common elements. But I'm actually writing this down in quotes because the question is, how would you define this? Um, it's because if I was to look at the, what I have here, the one common element here is easy for me to understand. Like It's a common element because every single set has it. But actually here I might call this zero common elements because I would say there's no common element that every set contains. Like I can't say every set contains three because here's a set that doesn't have three. Uh, but you could still you could still think about that way. Oh boy, we only have about four minutes left. Uh-huh. Yeah, so so we, we could we could try to do something there. We could try to do something with induction too. I'm gonna write that down. Let's see if we have any other ideas in this particular brainstorm that we ran. Uh, Matthew Garcia, you also had a hand up. Yeah, um, I was just thinking, so if we had any subsets of size one, well, first of all, we can only have at most one of them, because if we had two, then they wouldn't intersect. Okay, I'm going to write that down first, okay? So what you said is like, you can have at most one subset of size exactly one. Mm -hmm. And also... Else, if I'm just writing the, the explanation, else no yeah. intersect. Uh, else they don't intersect, right? Else there's a pair that doesn't intersect. Pair doesn't intersect. Okay, and what else did you want to say? And the other thing is if you do have one, then that element has to be in every other subset. Oh, because everything has to inter... Yeah, yeah. Okay, so like if you have an element, if you have a one element subset, the rule that everything has to intersect everything else in pairs means that everything else has to contain that one element. And so you'd be in the world now where you're saying, okay, I, I have a whole bunch of sets and they all contain this one element. That is true. Uh, then I'll write, in the case of 11, then uh, all... Uh, uh, all, all of the other sets must intersect it implies all have a common element. Okay, that's true. We have about two minutes left. Uh, I want to give a hint, and then maybe we can call for more hands uh, after the hint. The hint is this, this pairing is actually quite useful. So this pairing is quite useful because, you know, in some sense we're saying the worst case we hope is you take one from each. And now the, the game is you basically need to, need to show if someone gave you some lousy set collection with at most one from each, that you could add more stuff until you get one from each. That's the hint I want to give. It's like there's already a partition, uh, sorry, already a nice pairing. And so let's like assume we don't have it. How can we finish this from here? Okay, raise hand. Uh, just a second. Read Ayesh. 
Yeah. Oh wait. So I'm confused. Don't I? Don't we already just have the answer? Because like, uh, just from like number eleven, uh, we know there has to be like a subset of one, and we know that uh, that like if we uh, that if we like look at all possible subsets of S that do contain this one element, that can only be like. Um, they can only be like uh, two to the n minus one. So, isn't that isn't that pretty much it? Because mm -hmm. again, you have to have this subset of exactly size one. Because if you have like all the if you examine all the other subsets in F that do have at least one common element, then you can pick like a singleton set that does like have that shared element. So I think the slightly complicated piece about this is that th you could have a situation where F has no elements of no no sets of size one. Right. The the problem is that this picture here has no one element sets in it. So that particular example is great as long as you have one element subset. But it's but possible you, you don't have. Wait, I thought, wait, can you, I thought you can have, or sorry, I thought you must have like one element, like a singleton set, because if you do have, like if you do have all the other sets that do share one element, then there is a singleton set that does like contain that element, right? Or ah, OK, I understand what you're saying. So the thing is, first of all, this statement is saying you are not allowed to have two singletons. But the other thing is the transitivity didn't hold. So the claim is actually not true. Uh, it's actually not true that just because we have every pair intersect, that there's one common thing in all of them. So this is the example, right? In this particular example, I have half of the sets. And every pair intersects, but there's no one common element in all of them. So uh, what I'm going to do here is we've gone over time. So let okay. me give you let me give you some 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 direction. Oh, Adavid, you have a, you have a solution? Is it? Yep, possibly. So possibly. Let's have, let's see. Can we do this? Less than, if you have less than two to the n minus one sets, and you know whoever this lazy guy is claims that it's maximal, then there's at least one pair. Good. Let's try this. Okay. In so, there. so let's do this. I think this will work. So less than two to the n minus one sets in F, but still supposedly maximal. Yeah. We're so going to show it's not right. Supposedly yeah. maximal. So then there's like at least one pair that, that has neither of them. Then okay. there's at least one pair. I'll just call it a pair, which is like a and a complement, uh, where neither of those two is in F where neither A or A complement is in F. Now we want to get a contradiction. How? Right. So if you can't add A, that means there's a subset of A complement yes. in there. And if you can't add A complement, that means there's a subset of A in there. But those two subsets don't intersect. That's it. OK, so let me, let, let me just translate this. That's exactly right. So the deal is like, we're supposedly maximal. If you're supposedly maximal, that means that you can't add anything else. All right, why can't you add the A? There's this A and this A complement, and somehow neither of them is in F. Why can't you add A? Why can't you add A? Well, must be because there's some B in F that is disjoint, right? The only way that I can't add something is that it would fail to intersect. Oh, but I have A and A complement. That means that B is a subset. It's within. I'll call it a subset of A complement. That's exactly what it means if there's this A and there's some other disjoint subset. The disjoint subset lives in B complement. It's sort of like a, a Venn diagram where the Venn diagram is not really much of a Venn. It's like this. Right? It's like the whole thing is an A and a complement. And in order to have, like, not being able to add A, there's some B somewhere. B lives there. But now you do the same thing. You do the same thing and you say, why can't you add a complement? Because we supposedly said neither of them can be added. Why can't add a complement? Must be because there's some C in F that is disjoint from a complement. Oh, wait, that lives over here. It has to live inside A. Okay. 
So this C subset of A. And then the way you finish this is you say, now B and C are both in F, but disjoint. My F looks funny. But disjoint. Contradiction. And that finishes this. So that, that's just, I, uh, this is an example of how you think through these questions. Um, if you have some condition of like, you know, it's maximal, you go and start to question it. You, every time you have like assume for sake of contradiction, you're like, well, what, what could I do? Why, why, why can't I add that? Give an example, give a reason. And after you draw out the picture, you're like, oh, wow, I got a contradiction. So thank you. Uh, Erica, you, just, you had raised a hand. Is it because you wanted to make a comment on this or a question or? Oh, no, that was earlier. Oh, oops, sorry. OK. Well, in that case, we're done. Uh, so that's, that's, that's the questions for today. Uh, hopefully, these made some sense. Thank you to everyone. I'll see you next week. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. See you. And I'll say goodbye.